There is a negative side to this. We'll start to see rainfall patterns change, and we're seeing it already. We've had two consecutive years, 2008 and 2009, where the traditional April showers were much reduced, and we ended up seeing much more rain in, um, in, 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 in the month of August and September. And these so-called climate tipping points, where you get feedbacks in the system that become self-perpetuating, are already in the pipeline. We may well have crossed the first tipping point, which is the melting of Arctic ice, and there are other tipping points which will follow in hot pursuit. When I started this job in 2003, the typical forecast from most organisations was that there'd be no ice in the Arctic Ocean in the summertime by the end of the century. People were talking about the 2090s. A couple of years later, they started saying, well, maybe it's the 2070s, then the 2060s, and then in 2007, there was an extraordinary melt that fell off the graph. It was the melt forecast on a linear trend for 2055. I think probably the, the biggest tipping point of danger is the release of methane from melting permafrost. So yes, it's going to get pleasantly warm in Siberia, but that means all of the ground which is frozen will thaw out. A lot of it's waterlogged and that will release um, prodigious quantities of methane, which is 30 times stronger than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. The uh, rise in temperature of the ocean uh, and the increasing acidification of the ocean uh, can have huge effects on, for example, coral, coral reefs. Uh, if coral reefs were to disappear, and, it, and there are coral reef scientists who maintain that it is a real possibility within the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, if that happens, the disturbance of the ecosystem of the oceans as a whole could result in uh, huge uh, devastation um, and uh, humanity, which takes a lot of its food from fish, uh, may well find itself starving. What do we think that's going to happen when we start to face the very severe impacts of climate change and people stop exporting their food to us and we don't have enough? We will see the breakdown of civil society. Now, why not get ahead of the curve and start to change our infrastructure now whilst we live in the economic bubble we have? Why are we going to wait till we see economic society break down and the breakdown of civil society as well before we start to make those changes? One reason we might not want to change things is that we don't believe all the claims in the first place. Even though scientists' understanding of our effect on the climate has been improving for decades, there's a growing number of sceptics who don't trust the theory of human-induced climate change. It is the fault of environmentalists up to a point that the sceptic phenomenon has become so pervasive. And it's because environmentalism is just annoying to everyone else. If you say to people, because the, the Earth is heating up, you, you can't do all these things, Rather than not doing all those things, they'll say the Earth isn't heating up, and I think that's more or less what's happened. It's become more than just a grudge against environmentalists, though. The IPCC and other scientific groups have come under heavy fire from those who deny humans are the cause, giving rise to numerous scandals. Leaked emails and bogus facts have hit the news. It seems like the media frenzy is making the general public less trustful. There have been two pretty major bombshells in the world of climate science. One, the leaking or hacking of emails involving researchers at the University of East Anglia, which appear to suggest a readiness to interfere with the process of peer review, the system by which scientists judge each other's work, raising doubts about the integrity of those researchers. And in parallel, revelations that the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, its latest report, the fourth assessment report, contained pretty serious errors about the likely melt rates of Himalayan glaciers. And of course, given how many scientists are involved, there are bound to be uh, mistakes, errors, uh, slips in procedure, and in some cases, in any scientific community, there's bound to be an element of, of, of the occasional piece of research that's sort of fraudulent. And, and indeed, it's not surprising to me at all that what we've discovered is that uh, some of the behaviour of some of the scientists falls short. What this exposure has done is increase scepticism. What it hasn't done is unravel the years of work, the thousands of conferences and calculations on climate science, and made all the evidence disappear. Climate change scepticism only makes sense as a conspiracy theory. The idea that scientists are going to team up together and 
uh, destroy the business interests of people at ExxonMobil should strike anyone as being, well, almost absurd. It doesn't seem very likely to me that everyone's just jumping on the bandwagon for no reason and saying, yeah, we cause climate change. Even so, being sceptical doesn't necessarily mean denying we're having a major impact. Scepticism can be a good thing. What we need is collaboration with the unbiased common aim of finding out as much as we can as accurately as possible. Nothing is certain and you know, we, we won't know until, until it happens, but we can make a pretty good guess that things are moving in that direction. So there would be a consensus that, that the climate is changing and that humans are the, co are the cause of that change and that that change is likely to intensify. And that consensus, I think, would be shared by 97, 98, 99% of, of experts. We are, we are doomed to live in a world of uncertainty. And the question is, uh, what do you do when you think something might happen, but you're not sure it's going to happen? We are doomed to live with uncertainty. Still, it is very likely the net effect of our actions is changing the climate. Predictions say sea levels might rise by metres the Sahara might expand into Europe, more people might be starving and without water. They might not, but the risk is there, and it's a big risk. So, from what I've heard so far, most experts are concerned and would say there's a serious risk, but I know that's not true of everyone. Even if climate change is something that's in the newspaper or on television every day, lots of people, if not most people, don't really care very much. It's not something we want to worry about, and lots of people feel they don't need to. But some groups of people are already taking action. Not everybody is just thinking, who cares? For 15 years, the UN has been meeting to talk about climate change. And for 15, the last 15 years, emissions have only been going up. World leaders, I'm, I'm just very doubtful about whether, how much they truly care. I'm not convinced that they really value uh, climate change as any kind of big deal. Climate Camp is a movement of lots of varied individuals coming together to take action on climate change and the root causes of climate change. It raises awareness in society because there's significant media coverage of this and people do question and say, well, hold on, why are they taking it so seriously? Why is it growing every year? Why are we seeing more and more camps this year for the first time? We've seen a camp in Wales, we've seen a camp in Scotland, they're spreading over Europe, we're seeing them in the US, all happening in the last four years. Why are people so concerned? Now, just them asking that question is very good news. And these are interesting times now, and all hangs in the balance. So shake off your indifference and don your defiance. It's time to wake up and freak out. Shake up and speak out. For us, uh, what really needs to happen is for everybody to get together and for everybody to make the changes and for everybody to take the action necessary to deal with climate change. That has to come from, from individuals, from local groups. It has to come right from the bottom. Not everybody aware of the challenge thinks that's the way forward, though. It's easy to be cynical about how much effect would come from us making simple, little changes to our day-to-day -day lives, especially when you see soaring pollution in other countries, like that from China's coal expansion. So should it really be the governments of the world tackling this? And is it worth us individuals making any changes at all? It's a bit like saying, if I black out my windows, when uh, an enemy air force comes over Britain to bomb it, will I make much difference? Well, it's better that you do than you don't, but what you really need is an air force up there to deal with the problem. It's a problem of scale, and that's why it has to be governmental, and it has to have an international dimension. You, you only have the international level really to come together and agree on a common um, framework, common direction, um, guidelines for everyone on the ground. So it is an important element, I think, of, of the solution. But as we're seeing, we're not really making a lot of progress. We're not getting the kind of guidance um, and direction that we really need. 
So that direction is currently failing us. You end up everyone pointing at everyone else, demanding that everyone else does something, and no one, no one being prepared to make the first move. Looking forward, you have to ask, how is it that it could possibly be the case that the nations of the world could actually come together in a global agreement to reduce climate change emissions? Because the reality is that Western industrial lifestyles are so phenomenally unsustainable. There's no single answer to his question. You might even say there's no chance of success. But to say that alone would only be giving half the picture. The other half is a vision of change of attitudes that could have widespread influence, affecting decisions we make, as well as those made by businesses and even government. I think that, that what it uh, amounts to is a change of moral stance. That may sound sort of airy-fairy and vague. Um, you see, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the last war. Now, in the last war, um, uh, we ate everything that was put in front of us because, um, not because we thought that if I ate up a rather unpleasant piece of gristle or whatever, that I was going to defeat Hitler in itself, but because it was morally wrong to waste things. At that time, this country was short of food. Everybody was short of food. So it was wrong to throw food away, even if you, if you were lucky enough to have it. It was wrong to throw it away. Um, and equally, I think now that the, there has to be a, a moral change, a, mo a moral attitude, which says it is wrong to waste energy. It is, and of course, energy underlies everything. It underlies packaging, it underlies food, it underlies... Energy is what drives the whole system. So wasting of anything, whether it's petrol in your motor car, which you, uh, is bigger than you need, or, or leaving on a light, uh, which, is, which is unnecessary, that is a waste. Now you may say, well, that's sort of airy-fairy stuff, and, and uh, uh, who cares? And, and would it ever happen? Well, I'm putting in mind the fact that in the 19th century, uh, at one moment in the 19th century, uh, it was perfectly acceptable for people in this country, educated people and people of sense, to um, uh, accept that other human beings could be slaves. And within, within 20 years, it was intolerable. Uh, it was a, a change of moral attitude which swept the world. And we need another change of moral attitude to sweep the world about climate. In two days' time, the UN Summit on Climate Change starts in Copenhagen. I'm back in London because today, thousands of people who are already concerned are coming together to march to the Houses of Parliament and demand more real action. I thought I should come along and see what's going on. I asked some of the people on the march why they were there. Because uh, I think the, the government aren't taking it seriously enough. And I have very strong feelings that we need to do something about climate change. Now, not in another ten years. Because I think we need a strong climate change bill in Copenhagen. Because as a Muslim, my faith inspires me to do more as a steward of nature. And we're here because we want a future for our children. Um, I like blue face paint, so I thought it would be a good idea. Anything to do with the climate? Really? <laughs> you know, if, say, like the economy, if the economy crashes, it will come back up again. If the environment crashes, it's not coming back up again. I think it's important that we need to demonstrate for this because there's so much going on with Copenhagen and, you know, I think it is the last chance for us to do something about it. And the more people there are showing their support, I think, the more likely it is that something's actually going to happen. So everybody should be doing their bit. It will take more than this to definitely, definitively tackle climate change. We've come a long way, but we have much further to go. This was meant to be the moment, the pivotal moment where after two decades of concern about climate change, the international community set itself a rigorous set of globally agreed targets. What did emerge eventually was what's been widely regarded as an incredibly watery, uh, rather inconsequential agreement.